who's been doing this for about uh, five years under the coaching of Disney. It should look like I have a very lovely existence. You should see only the positivity. You probably see a lot of images of someone having a blast, uh, hopefully looking my best self ever. And that's what Instagram's about. That's what social media is about. And in fact, that's kind of what our world is about right now, particularly in the United States of America. And the awesome thing about that is that I have to reassure myself every night when I end up looking at somebody else's feed that it's all surface. Appearances are very deceptive and that's what that is. So every time you look at somebody's page and you have a thought about what an amazing, or you wish you were them or what an amazing life, just remember they're purposefully presenting their best self ever. And uh, of course, Instagram is deceptive. The one thing that's truthful about my Instagram is that basically it's 100% about my love of communication. And that's what you see throughout every image. This joy of putting forward some sort of minor story. My caption's all about storytelling. Um, I'm always trying to make sure that what you're seeing on that page is my truth, my communication, and that I'm communicating because I love communication. Uh, we're just gonna take a moment to address this technical glitch that, uh, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'm doing my own little signing. Um, so that, that joy of communication has always been with me. It's what I've loved. It's been my driving passion since I was four years old and cracked open my first book and started reading it out loud. And my parents were like, wow, she's a genius. Um, I wasn't. I just loved storytelling. And sadly for my parents, fell in love with acting way too young. So I was doomed from the start to be addicted to uh, performance. Anyway, um, that, that need to communicate has been my lifeblood. And what I basically want to, to say about that is that when you're hurled out of what you love, when that's stripped from you, whatever that moment is that that's taken away from you, you feel like you've lost any connection to yourself and to your truth. And unfortunately, that's happened to all of us in some minor degree in the past two years with COVID. But if you don't know, it happened to me times 80 million about 10 years ago. In fact, it will be exactly a month, 10 years ago. Next month is when this all happened to me. I didn't even realize that this was my 10th anniversary until I started prepping for this. But 10 years ago, I was hurled down a rabbit hole and into a hell that was so dark and so deep that I had no connection to any sense of who I was. Uh, I, couldn't even, I couldn't even communicate. So that joy, that ability, my magic power, my connection to who I was and to the world around me was completely stripped. And I felt like I had no choices. So that person on the Instagram and on that video who had a million choices and life was wide open and they could turn left and turn right and turn behind, turn a full 360, go 180. I felt like the only choice in front of me was one that was imposed on me and that was to survive. And that's a horrible place to feel, that the, the, to be and to feel like you have no choices. In fact, it felt like I had no choices and the only choice was what people were telling me were my choices. And I can't think of a, a more distancing, more alienating, more isolating and lonely feeling than the fact that you are just stuck. And I know that no matter where any of us are in the world right now, no matter what our circumstance, based on the past two years, based on what we may have been born into, based on where we've put ourselves into, that feeling of feeling stuck is something that we can all relate to or the inability to make a choice. The only choice that I felt like I had, and it's, it's heartbreaking even now to look back on it, but the only choice I felt that I had was maybe to somehow stop feeling what I was feeling. And that's when you know you've hit your absolute low. I didn't like drugs. I didn't like the feeling of disconnecting from my thoughts. So unfortunately, painkillers were not really an option for me, which probably would have helped numb some of what was going on because the pain from what I went through was so excruciating. Um, I'm sure that some of you have read about the story. A lot of you probably haven't. So I will give you the nutshell just so that you can relate to what I'm talking about and what that hell was. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, 
I was diagnosed with something so rare that all the doctors and specialists here in Los Angeles and in New York had problems identifying it at first. It was called dermatofibrosarcoma protuberans. That's terrifying. And what it was, it was deemed fatal because of where it was located. It was underneath my brain, um, literally looked like it was connected to my brain stem and behind my jaw. And it was impossible to get a clear angle at it, but it was huge. It was the size of a golf ball. And it was a very rare tumor that had been just in existence for God knows how long, no symptoms, no pain. But there was something very slight that I started to detect when I would do voiceover and it was a little tiny catch at the back of my jaw, that's it. Had I not even been in tune with that, it still would be there. And it was a ticking time bomb. And I had about three to five more years before they could guess that it would basically dissolve and turn into brain cancer. That's terrifying. And that diagnosis got handed out of the blue and I was told that it was fatal. Most of the specialists that I went to couldn't even figure out how they would get to it because to get to it would destroy me. So my only option was to either live with it and live out the rest of my days with it, just waiting, or to keep looking and seeking and trying to find somebody who would address it. I got really lucky, if you want to call it lucky in these circumstances, and found the one maverick doctor, an amazing brain surgeon who was willing to give it a shot, but he warned me that in going in there, there was the possibility that while they may save my life, and he was pretty sure that he could, there was a very good chance that it would um, affect my ability to ever speak again in that they'd have to sever my facial nerve. And if you don't know what that means, it means that I would be cut off from any ability to move my face. There was also a good chance that um, it would sever my ability to hear. So I would be left basically deaf and mute. So I went literally overnight from being this sort of thriving voice talent who loved communication, who lived for that experience of exchanging and telling story to, sto telling stories to being told that one day, very soon, I may be unable to move my face and speak and that I might well be deaf. On top of that, I would be disfigured and I would be temporarily disfigured, grossly temporarily disfigured while this was all being taken apart and put back together. And there was a good chance that they may be able to reconstruct everything, but it wasn't a guarantee. So that's what I walked into 10 years ago in 2013. And so now maybe you can understand the hell that I'm relating to. And coming out of that surgery, they never give you the manual on the backside of surgery. They should of what you could run into and what to expect. But I was horribly disfigured, deformed. I could not speak. Uh, I couldn't hear out of one ear. And the pain was excruciating. And as I said, I, I didn't like painkillers. So I basically was stuck either in horrible pain or disconnected from feeling like I could even think. And the one choice that I felt that I had, as I said, was maybe just not to be in this pain anymore. And you can imagine what road that takes you down. Thankfully, thankfully, the idea of not living at all was never appealing to me. But I did feel locked in a hell and in a prison and in a dark chamber that I had no idea how I was going to let myself out of. The one thing that saved me and the one thing that helped me get past that feeling of not having any choice in the world was remembering the saying that somebody had thrown out years ago. It was like this Buddhist fortune cookie saying that at the time I remember I had laughed at and made fun of. I'd actually said something sarcastic. It feels like maybe the Mad Hatters riddles that he threw at Alice when she was trying to find her way out of Alice, Alice in Wonderland. But it was that in every moment, we have a million choices. Somebody says that to you right now and you go, really, a million choices? Maybe I have one or two. But the Buddhists believe that. And beyond that, it's sort of a, a thriving culture outside of the United States that you do have choices in the moment, that one does have some amount of connectivity, connection to an ability to do something. It may not be that far reaching ultimate goal. It may not be where you'd like to transport yourself instantly in the moment, but you have a choice. And that 
remembering that fortune cookie saying that crazy Buddhist in every moment, there's a million choices at my darkest moments actually saved me because in playing with that riddle and trying to figure out, oh yeah, I have no choices. I'm in pain. I'm disfigured. I can't speak. I can't work. I don't know what my next day is going to look like, let alone my next three seconds. But I realized that I was thinking. I actually was thinking about what my choices were. And that in itself was a choice. I had made the conscious decision to start examining what my choices were. I know that sounds nuts, but it's the truth. I was now thinking not about how stuck I was, but what the hell were my choices? Okay. With that thought, incrementally, I mean, I'm talking like microscopically, I realized that I could make little tiny moment to moment decisions, left, right, forward, try to take a sip of water, don't, ask for some help, don't, take a nap, don't. Again, we're talking microscopic, not dramatic, not interesting, but it literally was this sort of tiny incremental moment to moment making choices that at least gave me the feeling like I could do something other than be stuck and feel locked. And just by focusing on that, again, incrementally, baby steps, they call it, I found myself from moment to moment healing through the experience and getting to the next step. It was a long road. If you look at me right now, hopefully, hopefully you're thinking, wow, I can't even tell. But it took a lot to get back to that. Whatever our circumstances, no matter how crappy, no matter what is going on in our world, we do have these little tiny incremental choices that we can make. And whatever our abilities, whatever we're hoping for, whatever we're reaching for, just try to maybe zero in on one little tiny choice that you can make that will get you to the next moment. Or one little brave, courageous step you could take that you didn't think you could take five minutes ago and dare yourself to just kind of keep moving forward. At least that was one thing that helped me. Moving past the, the dark hell that I had found myself in and moving on to the next steps of getting out of this traumatic circumstance, sort of entering into real life. Um, the one thing that, that kind of led me to the next step onto, you know, I'd call it maybe my eighth step was remembering that I had connected to joy before I went backward to remember to what I loved and I would allow myself to kind of dive back into that. And sometimes we need to go backward and look back at where we came from or what we loved before. It felt so far away. In fact, I'll tell you one little anecdote before we move on past it. But as I was nearing my third month of not being able to speak and finally able to eat real food again, it took three months. My friend bundled me up in the car and we went to a McDonald's drive through because she asked me, what is the one thing that I've been craving or really missing? You would think it would be some gourmet, amazing meal that I'd had, but no, somehow connecting to my childhood or remembering what I really loved reminded me of McDonald's French fries. <laughs> so she bundled me up and we went through a drive through And I remember having been quarantined, truly quarantined for those three months. Just the experience of being outside, seeing the sun, going through the McDonald's drive through it was like a whole other life. But I was reminding myself of who I was. I actually, in that moment, was reminding myself of who, of who I was, what I loved, what had brought me joy. And that pushed me another step forward. So again, just to say it out loud, when you make those incremental steps, it's okay to also look back. And try to remind yourself way back when it could be when you were five years old what brought you joy balloons disneyland a favorite album a favorite song favorite food you have that choice too so i feel like there's so much that i want to cram into this but i know that a really key part of this that, that i promised marcy and christina and the amazing team of students out there that i would allow you to ask me questions about what it is that i went through what it was like to lose the ability to do anything other than exist and breathe, what it was like to come through that and heal through it, and what it's like to be me today. The only other thing I'll say before I open it back up to everybody, <laughs> whoever has questions, is that, and I know a lot of you do know this because thank God the new messaging is there are disabilities that are invisible. 
but invisible invisible uh, disabilities are just as real as the physical ones, and particularly to the person who's struggling with them, whether it's anxiety, some sort of a mental disconnect, some sort of inability to move around, anxiety, depression. Um, there's a lot of different versions of ways that people can be stuck and disabled or feel like they are. And I am here to voluntarily offer up that I have gone through all of them. And I do know that the one thing that at least I feel helps me to somehow maneuver through it and around it is to keep remembering that there are choices and you have those choices. I love you guys for listening to that. And I'm going to open it wide open, crack it open for you guys to go ahead and dive in and ask me your questions. Thank you for sharing your journey with us, Kat. It really, it really is awe-inspiring. And I think for all of us, it's always nice to know that we're not alone in what we're dealing with, right? There's always somebody who's, you know, maybe dealing with something similar or, you know, different things that we can relate to as a group. So again, thank you so much for sharing that. The audience has been peppering me with questions in the Q&A and private uh, messages. So I'm going to jump right in. We do have one of our guests who we're going to go ahead and bring um, on camera to ask her question. Uh, we have La Shawnee, so I'm going to go ahead and promote her so she can turn on her camera and ask her question live. Hi, um, like she said, my name is La Shanae, and my question is, in your TED Talk, you discussed the importance of unproductive time and how in turn it allows you to immerse yourself in your downtime activities. In a time where social media and the internet is at our disposal 24 seven, how do you um, reinforce your boundaries to unplug and enjoy your downtime? <laughs> it's a great question. And I wish I had a really, I wish I had a complex, you know, deeply intelligent answer to your amazing question. But all I have is a very simple one. You simply make the choice to do so. It's really the only way to do it because unless you make that conscious choice and physically turn off your phone, turn off the television, walk away from the computer, obviously something's always gonna grab you. I find myself even at night, even when I'm exhausted, just scrolling through it because there's kind of that addictive, fun little tweak of joy that you get from it. It is an addiction. Um, and for anybody who, who has ever lost their phone or left it at home, you know I'm telling the truth. You feel like you've literally just left a piece of you somewhere that you need to reconnect with. So it is unfortunately a, a very mandatory feeling. You simply make that choice. You, you give yourself the challenge of for this half a Sunday, I exist here in the moment, turn the phone off. You let people know, you know, obviously if you're married or have children or you have other obligations outside of yourself, you communicate ahead of time to people, by the way, Sunday from one to six, I'm going to be off the grid. I'm going to be taking some me time. I know a lot of adults who actually do that these days, because if they don't, you never find yourself back to sanity. You always are kind of living on this caffeinated buzz of not quite being in the moment and just trying to get through the next 50 million things without feeling like you've reconnected to yourself. And even those three or four hours, whatever, whatever you choose to do with them without looking at your phone, it's amazing how the brain refreshes and the endorphins that you get from just being present in the moment and not having to look at technology. I hope that helps. <laughs> next. Thank you, La Shawnee. We are going to move on to our next question, but I did want to say, Kat, I think that is great advice to notify people if you're gonna take that break from social media or from answering your phone. Cause I'll tell you what, when my mom calls and I don't answer, she immediately goes to that I'm lying in a ditch somewhere. So I think that's great advice. Thank you. We're gonna go ahead and bring up um, Jade Romero to ask her question as well. Uh, so I just promoted her to a panelist. She should be coming on. Welcome Jade. Hello. Hi. Oh my God. I didn't want my thing. Okay. Hi. <laughs> um, my question was, you had shared your story about being diagnosed with dermatofibrosacoma 
pro Tabernus. In- oh my gosh, you did it. That's fancy. You can be a voiceover <laughs> Thank artist. You. Thank you. Um, many times to say that. <laughs> so you shared your story about getting diagnosed with that in 2012 and the two subsequent years of life-threatening surgeries. And then you underwent specialized treatment and then sessions with speech language pathologists to regain your ability to speak. So what motivated you while facing these challenges? And then do you have any other motivating words for others? Well, I mean, as I, as I shared, what motivated me was reconnecting to that, that thought, that fortune cookie saying that Buddhist truth, that in every moment you do have choices, that that's what motivated me was realizing that I wasn't stuck and as much as a victim as it felt like that I actually could make tiny incremental choices to move myself forward they weren't always fun choices and again like I said it's not like I could snap my fingers or rub on a lamp and say I wish I were now in Hawaii looking like myself and you know booking an amazing gig I could make incremental choices that would at least help me feel like I was getting somewhere moving forward slowly tiny And then, as I mentioned, you know, reconnecting to things that had inspired me when I was younger, like the McDonald's French fries, (laughs) but other, you know, other things, remembering what had given me joy, why I'd gone into voiceover, um, going back down memory lane as to what originally had motivated me to get there in the first place were lifesavers at that time. Thank you. Of course. Thank you. All right, so I do have another question from someone who we're gonna promote to a panelist. Um, Elizabeth Powers, we're gonna be promoting you if you're ready to ask your question live. Just promoted her to panelists. She should be coming on any moment. Here we go. Welcome, Elizabeth. Hello. Hello. Um, my question is, it is apparent that you voice over for a lot of Disney-related movies, like Tarzan and Tinkerbell. What impact did these roles have on your career? Oh, that's a good question. What impact? Uh, I don't think they really had, like, an impact on my, if I'm being authentic, I don't think it really impacted my career other than the joy of booking those and adding another great credit to my resume and the confidence that that gives you. I think every actor, um, I can speak on behalf of all of us (laughs) from Julia Roberts and Brad Pitt on down to us voice talent. What connects us to acting is an addiction to that feeling of we did something that somebody else loved. That's why we do what we do. We, We love if it's not literal applause, we love that vibe of somebody loved what we did performance wise. And so when you get a booking like that, it just sort of feels like this major validation and pat on the back to just keep going. That's what makes acting so tricky because um, you audition constantly, but you only know if you're doing well, usually if you book something and you can go months sometimes without booking something new. So to keep that motivation and drive, that's, that's the fun part of being a working actor. Um, fortunately, if you keep going, it's not months in between, but it can feel like it. So I would say that the thing that, that those two roles gave me was this sort of pat on the back that I was in the right direction and just keep doing it. Um, I heard it, by the way, if, if everybody can hear this, I heard a great saying from a, a famous artist. Um, I don't know if any of you out there will know who he is. He's way before my generation also, but Andy Warhol was this famous painter. And someone once asked him what was the key to his success. Um, And his answer was, I, while, while I am waiting for everybody else to get back to me as to whether or not what I'm doing is any good, I just keep doing it. In other words, he's not waiting for the validation. While everybody else tries to decide whether or not his art was good, he just kept making it. And I think in a sense, as an actor, that's what you kind of have to keep doing is I may or may not hear from anybody. I may get a call back. I may not. I may get a gig. I may not. But I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing because eventually it does stick if you're persistent. So um, I hope that is a fuller 360 answer to your lovely question about what those two roles, what the impact they had on my career. 
Thank you, Kat. And thank you, Elizabeth, for joining us to answer that question. Um, I am going to go ahead and promote our next uh, individual who had a question for you. Uh, so Sam Santos, we are promoting you to panelists now. Hello. Thank you. Sorry about that. It made me rejoin. <laughs> So my question for you, Kat, is what recommendations would you give to someone wanting to get into voice acting? Well, that is a great question. And I get asked that probably about 20 times a week on social media. Um, and it's a great question. Probably the first thing that I usually do is I throw it back to somebody. And I try to ask them, why do you want to get into voiceover? Why do you think you want to be in voiceover? Um, because just answering that question alone does help you lead you to next steps um, or not. Uh, a lot of people, again, I'm not saying you, but a lot of people ask that question because they think it looks so easy and effortless, or it looks like such a cool thing to do. That's so much fun and a great way to make money and become minorly famous, maybe. Um, I, I can reassure you on that point, it's not. It's not easy, it's not effortless, and it's a lot of training to even get to your first audition. And I know the person on the other side of the glass knows that well because he offers amazing voiceover classes to those wanting to get into it. So I'm gonna take a moment, just say Real Voice LA, like them, follow them on Instagram, and they teach amazing classes. Um, but ask yourself first why you want to go into it because it's not 